This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ankila. This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two: The Education of a Personage. Chapter Five: The Egotist Becomes a Personage. Part Two: The Big Man with Goggles. On the day that Amory started on his walk to Princeton, the sky was a colorless vault, cool, high, and barren of the threat of rain. It was a gray day, that least fleshly of all weathers, a day of dreams and far hopes and clear visions. It was a day easily associated with those abstract truths and purities that dissolve in the sunshine or fade out in mocking laughter by the light of the moon. The trees and clouds were carved in classical severity. The sounds of the countryside had harmonized to a monotone, metallic as a trumpet, breathless as a Grecian urn. The day had put Amory in such a contemplative mood that he caused much annoyance to several motorists who were forced to slow up considerably or else run him down. So engrossed in his thoughts was he that he was scarcely surprised at that strange phenomenon, cordiality manifested within fifty miles of Manhattan, when a passing car slowed down beside him and a voice hailed him. He looked up and saw a magnificent locomobile in which sat two middle-aged men, one of them small and anxious-looking, apparently an artificial growth on the other who was large and begoggled and imposing. "'Do you want a lift?' asked the apparently artificial growth, glancing from the corner of his eye at the imposing man as if for some habitual silent corroboration. "'You bet I do! Thanks!' The chauffeur swung open the door, and, climbing in, Amory settled himself in the middle of the back seat. He took in his companions curiously. The chief characteristic of the big man seemed to be a great confidence in himself set off against a tremendous boredom with everything around him. That part of his face which protruded under the goggles was what is generally termed strong. Rolls of not undignified fat had collected near his chin. Somewhere above was a wide, thin mouth and a rough model for a Roman nose, and below his shoulders collapsed without a struggle into the powerful bulk of his chest and belly. He was excellently and quietly dressed. Emory noticed that he was inclined to stare straight at the back of the chauffeur's head, as if speculating steadily but hopelessly some baffling hirsute problem. The smaller man was remarkable only for his complete submersion in the personality of the other. He was of that lower secretarial type, who at forty have engraved upon their business cards assistant to the president, and without a sigh, consecrate the rest of their lives to second-hand mannerisms. "'Going far?' asked the smaller man in a pleasant, disinterested way. "'Quite a stretch!' "'Hiking for exercise?' "'No,' responded Anne-Marie succinctly. "'I'm walking because I can't afford to ride.' "'Oh. Then again, are you looking for work? Because there's lots of work,' he continued rather testily. "'All this talk of lack of work. The West is especially short of labor.' He expressed the West with a sweeping lateral gesture. Anne-Marie nodded politely. "'Have you a trade?' "'No. Amory had no trade.' "'Clerk, eh?' "'No. Amory was not a clerk.' "'Whatever your line is,' said the little man, seeming to agree wisely with something Amory had said, "'now is the time of opportunity and business openings.' He glanced again toward the big man, as a lawyer grilling a witness glances involuntarily at the jury. Amory decided that he must say something, and, for the life of him, could think of only one thing to say. "'Of course, I want a great lot of money.' The little man laughed mirthlessly, but conscientiously. "'That's what everyone wants nowadays. But they don't want to work for it.' "'A very natural, healthy desire. Almost all normal people want to be rich, without great effort, except the financiers in Problem Place, who want to crash their way through. Don't you want easy money?' "'Of course not,' said the secretary indignantly. "But." continued Amory, disregarding him. Being very poor at present, I am contemplating socialism as possibly my forte. Both men glanced at him curiously. These bomb-throwers! The little man ceased, as words lurched ponderously from the big man's chest. If I thought you were a bomb-thrower, I'd run you over to the New York jail. That's what I think of socialists. Amory laughed. What are you? asked the big man. One of these parlor Bolsheviks? 
one of these idealists? I must say I fail to see the difference. The idealists loaf around and write the stuff that stirs up the poor immigrants. Well, said Amory, if being an idealist is both safe and lucrative, I might try it. What's your difficulty? Lost your job? Not exactly, but, well, call it that. What is it? Writing copy for an advertising agency. Lots of money in advertising. Amory smiled discreetly. Oh, I'll admit there's money in it eventually. Talent doesn't starve you any more. Even art gets enough to eat these days. Artists draw your magazine covers, write your advertisements, hash out ragtime for your theatres. By the great commercializing of printing, you've found a harmless, polite occupation for every genius who might have carved his own niche. But beware the artist who's an intellectual, also. The artist who doesn't fit. The Rousseau, the Tolstoy, the Samuel Butler, the Amory Blaine. "'Who's he?' demanded the little man suspiciously. "'Well,' said Amory, "'he's, uh, he's an intellectual personage, not very well known at present.' The little man laughed his conscientious laugh, and stopped rather suddenly as Amory's burning eyes turned on him. "'What are you laughing at? These intellectual people. Do you know what it means?' The little man's eyes twitched nervously. "'Why, it usually means. It always means brainy and well-educated,' interrupted Amory. "'It means having an active knowledge of the race's experience.' Amory decided to be very rude. He turned to the big man. "'The young man,' he indicated the secretary with his thumb, and said young man, as one says, bellboy, with no implication of youth, "'has the usual muddled connotation of all popular words.' "'You object to the fact that capital controls printing?' said the big man, fixing him with his goggles. "'Yes, and I object to doing their mental work for them. It seemed to me that the root of all the business I saw around me consisted in overworking and underpaying a bunch of dubs who submitted to it.' "'Here now,' said the big man, "'you'll have to admit that the laboring man is certainly highly paid. Five and six-hour days. It's ridiculous. You can't buy an honest day's work from a man in the trades unions.' "'You've brought it on yourselves,' insisted Amory. "'You people never make concessions until they're wrung out of you.' "'What people?' "'Your class. The class I belonged to until recently. Those who by inheritance or industry or brains or dishonesty have become the moneyed class.' "'Do you imagine that if the road-mender over there had the money he'd be any more willing to give it up?' "'No. But what's that got to do with it?' The older man considered. "'No. I'll admit it hasn't. It rather sounds as if it had, though.' "'In fact,' continued Amory, "'he'd be worse. The lower classes are narrower, less pleasant, and personally more selfish, certainly more stupid. But all that has nothing to do with the question.' "'Just exactly what is the question?' "'Here.' Emory had to pause and consider exactly what the question was. Emory coins a phrase. "'When life gets hold of a brainy man of fair education,' began Emory slowly, "'that is, when he marries, he becomes, nine times out of ten, a conservative, as far as existing social conditions are concerned. He may be unselfish, kind-hearted, even just in his own way, but his first job is to provide and to hold fast.' His wife shoes him on, from ten thousand a year to twenty thousand a year, on and on, in an enclosed treadmill that hasn't any windows. He's done. Life's got him. He's no help. He's a spiritually married man. Amory paused and decided that it wasn't such a bad phrase. Some men, he continued, escape the grip. Maybe their wives have no social ambitions. Maybe they've hit a sentence or two in a dangerous book that pleased them. Maybe they started on the treadmill as I did and were knocked off. Anyway, they're the congressmen you can't bribe, the presidents who aren't politicians, the writers, speakers, scientists, statesmen who aren't just popular grab-bags for a half-dozen women and children. He's the natural radical? Yes, said Amory. He may vary from the disillusioned critic like old Thornton Hancock all the way to Trotsky. Now this spiritually unmarried man hasn't direct power, for unfortunately the spiritually married man, as a by-product of his money chase, has garnered in the great newspaper, the popular magazine, the influential weekly, so that Mrs. Newspaper, Mrs. Magazine, Mrs. Weekly can have a better limousine than all those oil people across the street or those cement people round the corner. Why not? 
it makes wealthy men the keepers of the world's intellectual conscience and of course a man who has money under one set of social institutions quite naturally can't risk his family's happiness by letting the clamor for another appear in his newspaper but it appears said the big man where in the discredited mediums rotten cheap papered weeklies all right go on well, my first point is that, through a mixture of conditions, of which the family is the first, there are these two sorts of brains. One sort takes human nature as it finds it, uses its timidity, its weakness, and its strength for its own ends. Opposed is the man who, being spiritually unmarried, continually seeks for new systems that will control or counteract human nature. His problem is harder. It is not life that's complicated, it's the struggle to guide and control life. That is his struggle. He is a part of problem progress the spiritually married man is not the big man produced three big cigars and proffered them on his huge palm the little man took one amory shook his head and reached for a cigarette go on talking said the big man i've been wanting to hear one of you fellows going faster modern life began Amory again, changes no longer century by century, but year by year, ten times faster than it ever has before. Populations doubling, civilizations unified more closely with other civilizations, economic interdependence, racial questions, and we're dawdling along. My idea is that we've got to go very much faster. He slightly emphasized the last words, and the chauffeur unconsciously increased the speed of the car. Amory and the big man laughed. The little man laughed, too, after a pause. "'Every child,' said Amory, "'should have an equal start. If his father can endow him with a good physique, and his mother with some common sense in his early education, that should be his heritage. If the father can't give him a good physique, if the mother has spent in chasing men the years in which she should have been preparing herself to educate her children, so much the worse for the child. He shouldn't be artificially bolstered up with money, sent to these horrible tutoring schools, dragged through college. Every boy ought to have an equal start.' "'All right,' said the big man, his goggles indicating neither approval nor objection. "'Next, I'd have a fair trial of government ownership of all industries.' "'That's been proven a failure.' "'No, it merely failed. "'If we had government ownership, we'd have the best analytical business minds in the government working for something besides themselves. "'We'd have McKay's instead of Burleson's. We'd have Morgans in the Treasury Department. We'd have Hills running interstate commerce. We'd have the best lawyers in the Senate. They wouldn't ha give their best efforts for nothing. McAdoo, no, said Amory, shaking his head. Money isn't the only stimulus that brings out the best that's in a man, even in America. You said a while ago that it was. It is, right now. But if it were made illegal to have more than a certain amount, the best men would all flock for the one other reward that attracts humanity, honor. The big man made a sound that was very like boo. That's the silliest thing you've said yet. No, it isn't silly. It's quite plausible. If you'd gone to college, you'd have been struck by the fact that the men there would work twice as hard for any one of a hundred petty honors as those other men did who were earning their way through. Kids! child's play scoffed his antagonist not by a darn sight unless we're all children did you ever see a grown man when he's trying for a secret society or a rising family whose name is up at some club they'll jump when they hear the sound of a word the idea that to make a man work you've got to hold gold in front of his eyes is a growth not an axiom we've done that for so long that we've forgotten there's any other way we've made a world where that's necessary let me tell you Amory became emphatic. If there were ten men insured against either wealth or starvation, and offered a green ribbon for five hours' work a day, and a blue ribbon for ten hours' work a day, nine out of ten of them would be trying for the blue ribbon. That competitive instinct only wants a badge. If the size of their house is the badge, they'll sweat their heads off for that. If it's only a blue ribbon, I damn near believe they'll work just as hard. They have in other ages. I don't agree with you. I know it said Amory, nodding sadly. It doesn't matter any more, though. I think these people are going to come and take what they want pretty soon. A fierce hiss came from the little man. Machine guns. Ah, but you've taught them their use. The big man shook his head. In this country, there are enough property owners not to permit that sort of thing. Amory wished he knew the statistics of property owners and non-property owners. He decided to change the subject, but the big man was aroused. 
When you talk of taking things away, you are on dangerous ground. How can they get it without taking it? For years people have been stalled off with promises. Socialism may not be progress, but the threat of the red flag is certainly the inspiring force of all reform. You've got to be sensational to get attention. Russia is your example of beneficent violence, I suppose. Quite possibly, admitted Emery. Of course, it's overflowing just as the French Revolution did, but I've no doubt that it's really a great experiment and well worth while. Don't you believe in moderation? He won't listen to moderates, and it's almost too late. The truth is that the public has done one of those startling and amazing things that they do about once in a hundred years. They've seized an idea. What is it? That however the brains and abilities of men may differ, their stomachs are essentially the same. The little man gets his. If you took all the money in the world, said the little man, with much profundity, and divided it up eek Oh, shut up! said Amory briskly, and paying no attention to the little man's enraged stare, he went on with his argument. The human stomach, he began, but the big man interrupted rather patiently. I'm letting you talk, you know, he said, but please avoid stomachs. I've been feeling mine all day. Anyway, I don't agree with one half you've said. Government ownership is the basis of your whole argument, and it's invariably a beehive of corruption. Men won't work for blue ribbons. That's all rot. When he ceased, the little man spoke up with a determined nod, as if resolved this time to have his say out. There are certain things which are human nature, he asserted with an owl-like look, which always have been and always will be, which can't be changed. Emery looked from the small man to the big man helplessly. Listen to that. That's what makes me discouraged with progress. Listen to that. I can name offhand over one hundred natural phenomena that have been changed by the will of man, a hundred instincts in man that have been wiped out or are now held in check by civilization. What this man here just said has been for thousands of years the last refuge of the associated muttonheads of the world. It negates the efforts of every scientist, statesman, moralist, reformer, doctor, and philosopher that ever gave his life to humanity's service. It's a flat impeachment of all that's worth while in human nature. Every person over twenty-five years old who makes that statement in cold blood ought to be deprived of the franchise. The little man leaned back against the seat, his face purple with rage. Amory continued, addressing his remarks to the big man. These quarter-educated, stale-minded men, such as your friend here, who think they think, every question that comes up, you'll find his type in the usual ghastly muddle. One minute it's the brutality and humanity of these Prussians. The next it's we ought to exterminate the whole German people. They always believe that things are in a bad way now, but they haven't any faith in these idealists. One minute they call Wilson just a dreamer, not practical. A year later they rail at him for making his dreams realities. They haven't clear logical ideas on one single subject except a sturdy, stolid opposition to all change. They don't think uneducated people should be highly paid, but they won't see that if they don't pay the uneducated people, their children are going to be uneducated too. And we're going round and round in a circle. That is the great middle class. The big man, with a broad grin on his face, leaned over and smiled at the little man. You're catching it pretty heavy, Garvin. How do you feel? The little man made an attempt to smile and act as if the whole matter were so ridiculous as to be beneath notice, but Amory was not through. The theory that people are fit to govern themselves rests on this man. If he can be educated to think clearly, concisely, and logically, freed of his habit of taking refuge in platitudes and prejudices and sentimentalisms, then I'm a militant socialist. If he can't, then I don't think it matters much what happens to man or his systems now or hereafter. I am both interested and amused, said the big man. You are very young. Which may only mean that I have neither been corrupted nor made timid by contemporary experience. I possess the most valuable experience, the experience of the race, for in spite of going to college I've managed to pick up a good education. You talk lively. It's not all rubbish, cried Amory passionately. This is the first time in my life I've argued socialism. It's the only panacea I know. I'm restless. My whole generation is restless. I'm sick of a system where the richest man gets the most beautiful girl if he wants her, where the artist without an income has to sell his talents to a button manufacturer. Even if I had no talents, I'd not be content to work ten years condemned either to celibacy or a furtive indulgence to give some man's son an automobile. 
but if you're not sure that doesn't matter exclaimed amory my position couldn't be worse a social revolution might land me on top of course i'm selfish it seems to me i've been a fish out of water in too many outworn systems i was probably one of the two dozen men in my class at college who got a decent education still they'd let any well-tutored flathead play football and i was ineligible because some silly old men thought we should all profit by conic sections i loathed the army i loathed business i'm in love with change and i've killed my conscience so you'll go along crying that we must go faster that at least is true amory insisted reform won't catch up to the needs of civilization unless it's made to a laissez-faire policy is like spoiling a child by saying he'll turn out all right in the end he will if he's made to but you don't believe all this socialist patter you talk i don't know until i talked to you i hadn't thought seriously about it i wasn't sure of half of what i said you puzzle me said the big man but you're all alike they say bernard shaw in spite of his doctrines is the most exacting of all dramatists about his royalties to the last farthing well said amory i simply state that i'm a product of a versatile mind in a restless generation with every reason to throw my mind and pen in with the radicals even if deep in my heart i thought we were all blind atoms in a world as limited as a stroke of a pendulum i and my sort would struggle against tradition try at least to displace old camps with new ones i've thought i was right about life at various times but faith is difficult one thing i know if living isn't a seeking for the grail it may be a damned amusing game for a minute neither spoke and then the big man asked what was your university princeton the big man became suddenly interested the expression of its goggles altered slightly i sent my son to princeton did you perhaps you knew him his name was jesse frenenby he was killed last year in france i knew him very well in fact he was one of my particular friends he was a quite a fine boy we were very close amory began to perceive a resemblance between the father and the dead son and he told himself that there had been all along a sense of familiarity jesse farrenby the man who in college had borne off the crown that he had aspired to it was all so far away what little boys they had been working for blue ribbons the car slowed up at the entrance to a great estate ringed around by a huge hedge and a tall iron fence won't you come in for lunch amory shook his head thank you mr farrenby but i've got to get on the big man held out his hand amory saw that the fact that he had known jesse more than outweighed any disfavor he had created by his opinions what ghosts were people with which to work even the little man insisted on shaking hands good-bye shouted mr farrenby as the car turned the corner and started up the drive good luck to you and bad luck to your theories same to you sir cried amory smiling and waving his hand out of the fire out of the little room eight hours from princeton amory sat down by the jersey roadside and looked at the frost-bitten country nature as a rather coarse phenomenon composed largely of flowers that when closely inspected appeared moth-eaten and of ants that endlessly traversed blades of grass was always disillusioning nature represented by skies and waters and far horizons was more likable frost and the promise of winter thrilled him now made him think of a wild battle between st regis and groton ages ago seven years ago and of an autumn day in france twelve months before when he had lain in tall grass his platoon flattened down close around him waiting to tap the shoulders of a lewis gunner he saw the two pictures together with somewhat the same primitive exaltation two games he had played differing in quality of acerbity linked in a way that differed them from rosalind or the subject of labyrinths which were after all the business of life i am selfish he thought this is not a quality that will change when i see human suffering or lose my parents or help others this selfishness is not only part of me it is the most living part it is by somehow transcending rather than by avoiding that selfishness that i can bring poise and balance into my life there is no virtue of unselfishness that i cannot use i can make sacrifices be charitable give to a friend endure for a friend lay down my life for a friend all because these things may be the best possible expression of myself 
yet I have not one drop of the milk of human kindness. The problem of evil had solidified for Amory into the problem of sex. He was beginning to identify evil with the strong phallic worship in Brook and the early wells. Inseparably linked with evil was beauty, beauty still a constant rising tumult, soft in Eleanor's voice, in an old song at night, riding deliriously through life like superimposed waterfalls, half rhythm, half darkness. Amory knew that every time he had reached toward it, longingly, it had leered out at him with the grotesque face of evil. Beauty of great art, beauty of all joy, most of all the beauty of women. After all, it had too many associations with license and indulgence. Weak things were often beautiful, weak things were never good. And in this new loneness of his that had been selected for what greatness he might achieve, beauty must be relative or itself a harmony. It would make only a discord. In a sense, this gradual renunciation of beauty was the second step after his disillusion had been made complete. He felt that he was leaving behind him his chance of being a certain type of artist. It seemed so much more important to be a certain sort of man. His mind turned a corner suddenly, and he found himself thinking of the Catholic Church. The idea was strong in him that there was a certain intrinsic lack in those to whom Orthodox religion was necessary, and religion to Amory meant the Church of Rome. Quite conceivably, it was an empty ritual, but it was seemingly the only assimilative traditionary bulwark against the decay of morals. Until the great mobs could be educated into a moral sense, someone must cry, Thou shalt not! Yet, any acceptance was, for the present, impossible. He wanted time, and the absence of ulterior pressure. He wanted to keep the tree without ornaments, realize fully the direction and momentum of this new start. The afternoon waned from the purging good of three o'clock to the golden beauty of four. Afterward, he walked through the dull ache of a setting sun, when even the clouds seemed bleeding, and at twilight he came to a graveyard. There was a dusky, dreamy smell of flowers and the ghost of a new moon in the sky and shadows everywhere. On an impulse, he considered trying to open the door of a rusty iron vault built into the side of a hill. A vault washed clean and covered with late-blooming, weepy, watery blue flowers that might have grown from dead eyes, sticky to the touch with a sickening odor. Amory wanted to feel William Dayfield, 1864. He wondered that graves ever made people consider life in vain. Somehow, he could find nothing hopeless in having lived. All the broken columns and clasped hands and doves and angels meant romances. He fancied that in a hundred years he would like having young people speculate as to whether his eyes were brown or blue, and he hoped quite passionately that his grave would have about it an air of many, many years ago. It seemed strange that, out of a row of Union soldiers, two or three made him think of dead loves and dead lovers, when they were exactly like the rest, even to the yellowish moss. Long after midnight the towers and spires of Princeton were visible with here and there a late burning light, and suddenly out of the clear darkness the sound of bells. As an endless dream it went on, the spirit of the past brooding over a new generation. The chosen youth from the muddled, unchastened world still fed romantically on the mistakes and half-forgotten dreams of dead statesmen and poets. Here was a new generation, shouting the old cries, learning the old creeds, through a reverie of long days and nights, destined finally to go out into that dirty gray turmoil to follow love and pride, a new generation dedicated more than the last to the fear of poverty and the worship of success, grown up to find all gods dead, all wars fought, all faiths in man shaken. Amory, sorry for them, was still not sorry for himself. Art, politics, religion, Whatever his medium should be, he knew he was safe now, free from all hysteria. He could accept what was acceptable, roam, grow, rebel, sleep deep through many nights. There was no God in his heart, he knew. His ideas were still in riot. There was ever the pain of memory, the regret for his lost youth, yet 
the waters of disillusion had left a deposit on his soul. Responsibility and a love of life, the faint stirring of old ambitions and unrealized dreams. But, oh, Rosalind, Rosalind. It's all a poor substitute at best, he said sadly. And he could not tell why the struggle was worth while, why he had determined to use the utmost himself and his heritage from the personalities he had passed. He stretched out his arms to the crystalline radiant sky. I know myself, he cried, but that is all. End of Book Two, Chapter Five, Part Two. End of This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald.